They're already recording me over here. Okay, this is our last class. I came, I try to come earlier than normal, but uh, everything is relative. So, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. Um, I want to see if I can do three things today, which is an awful lot. The first is I want to review what we've been, what we learned last week and the week before. The second is I want to learn a little chumash. Remember what we did by uh, the Be'eda Shal Miriam, where we actually read the chumash. I want to read the chumash, the beginning of Yisrael. And then with the remaining time, I want to introduce an idea which is deep and controversial. We're going to start it and not finish it. And from next year, I'm going to move on to something else. Uh, but at least I want to see if I can taste it this year. That's my plan. I want to taste it with you, okay? So the first thing is, let's, let's tell the story, okay? We're learning the story of the Chumash. That's what we're doing. We're learning the story of the Chumash. And the copies are coming, by the way, okay? The copies are coming. We learn the stories of the Chumash. The stories of the Chumash are, quote, history. But they're not history of the world. They're not. They're the history of the purpose of the world. Kavana Sabi. The purpose of the world is Taira. The purpose of the world is the Jewish people. The purpose of the world, ultimately, is that the whole world should live as Hashem wants us to live. And the Taira is the safe, it is the book that presents us with that point of view, with that angle, right? So we've been learning now, we're probably sitting here eight or nine years on this story. In other words, I started Lech Lecha with Tzichas, with the girls, in another building. And I regret not starting Bereshis, I want you to know. In hindsight, I should have started Bereshis. Why did I start Lech Lecha? And we learned a lot, a lot. A lot of sikhs, right? Vereshis, Lech Lecha, it doesn't sound like a lot of parshias, but we learned so many sikhs. And if I had to summarize what we learned in the story of the Torah, it's that there were two stories, two steps to the selection of the Jewish people. In other words, the fundamental statement is God did not create the world for parody. Hashem did not make the world that all people should be the same. Hashem created the world for all people would be the same, would be the same thing as saying that Hashem created every single person to be a bunch of heads. We have one head, two eyes, two, no, two nostrils, a mouth, two ears, a heart, a set of lungs, arms, legs, fingers, toes, hair, skin, nails. We're not the same. And in terms of the purpose of creation, which is people are not the same. There's a nation of God. I mean, that's really the story of the Chumash. There's a nation of God. Now, I know that this is not politically correct. The politically correct saying is that nobody's better than anybody else. But I have two choices. I have three choices. One choice is not to teach Taita. Second choice is to, to lie and say the Taita has to be changed because now we're smarter than we were when the Taita was written. And the third is to tell you the truth. The truth is the Taita does say very clearly, not all nations are the same. They're not. She did it already. Oh, you're, you're just... No. The air conditioning is bothering you. Yeah. Um, so without going to the question of fairness, right? The, the fairness is any person in the world who wishes to become a Jew is free to. In other words, yes, there's a nation that's been chosen, but anybody can join, as long as you understand the seriousness of this joining. I thank you, and I'm sorry, that you're binding yourself and your children and your grandchildren forever. I'd save call our data. Okay, everybody needs two of these. Okay, the first sheet and the second sheet. They're collated or they're not staple, but they're collated. Okay. Um, what the story of the Teda does say, the story of the Chumash does say, is that there's two stages to the identifying of this nation. The idea that Hashem has what we call, for lack of words, the chosen nation, the nation of God, 
has two steps. Step number one, an individual righteous person or an individual righteous couple. And the Abish tests them and tests them and tests them. And he, he brings them to a state as much as you can say this about people of human perfection, right? Avram and Sada represent the most perfect couple in terms of their loyalty, in terms of their faith, in terms of their trust to HaKadosh Baruch. They earn the right. They earn the right to become the father and the mother of the Jewish people. And then there's Yitzchak and Ifki, Yankov and Lachal and then there's the 12 Shvatim. The next big step is that there's a nation, millions of people, and they're dafke, tzadikim, beinim, urishayim. They're not all holy. Some of them are quite ordinary, and some of them are below average. Those are the two big steps, right? The Chumash is the story of the purpose of the world, not the world, the purpose of the world. In other words, the Chumash is the story of the world vis-a-vis -vis the fact that in the end, this world is going to be governed by Hashem according to the principles of the Torah. The Torah is the beginning of that story, beginning with creation itself and then, the, then all the other things that happen. But there's two big stages, steps in relation to the Jewish people, the isolation, identifying of one perfect couple, Abraham and Sarah, and then that from them comes a people that are very imperfect. That's us, right? The Jewish people are interesting complex, diverse, competitive, right? But it's amazing. I mean, Jewish people, the bracha, I don't think Jewish people are, are different than Goyim. They're not. But the brachas that we have, the love that Hashem shows us, is it's just remarkable to see Yidin's place in the world. It's, it's, it's not because we're smarter. It's not because we're more ingenious. It's not because we're better at sabers. It's because the Abish still loves us. I, there's no doubt in my mind that that's the way it is. Okay? But that's the story of the Chomish. Right, first identifying of a perfect couple, and then the creation of a nation. Between this and this is 500 years. The birth of Abraham Avinu, the Tzitzim time, is exactly 500 years, and we went through a lot of stuff in those 500 years. We come out of its time. We're going towards receiving the Teda, and the story we're currently telling is the story of the first convert. That's what the story we tell. The story that we're telling is the story of the first convert. His name is Yisrael Jethro. And the story has two parts. Number one, the Yisrael converts. Number two, the Yisrael leaves his home and joins us in the desert. There are two separate things. Yisrael could have stayed in Midian and converted and adopted the Jewish religion. But instead, he chooses to leave where he lives, to come out into the desert and join us. And Rashi asks the question, Ma shmu shama ubo? What Yisrael heard that makes him convert, we know. But what Yisrael heard that makes him leave his home and come out into a desert and become one of the Jewish people, this is the question that Rashi asks. Rashi says he heard two things, the splitting of the sea and the war with Amalek. And we learned two sikhs, two different sikhs. The first sikh we learned is Chedekir Aleph, where the Rebbe says Yisrael came because he realized that we need him, that we need him. But the title would not be given until Yisrael shows up. He hears about the splitting of the sea, and nevertheless, Amalek attacks us. After all of these Amalek, Amalek attacks us, then he, we, he needs to join us. As the Zayar says, until Yisrael would come and join the Jewish ranks, the title would not be given because Yisrael is what's called Yisrael, the extra light that comes from darkness, Yisrael, the extra wisdom which comes from foolishness. Yisrael was an incredible great chacham. He was a deep, deep thinker, a theologian and philosopher. And uh, his acknowledgement that the Torah's chacham is greater than all the other chachmas that he knew contributes something for us. Okay, that was the first year. Now we're learning a second sikh. And the second sikh is that Yisrael leaves his home, not for us, but for him. Yisrael realizes it's not enough for me to adopt the Jewish way of life and say, in Midian, I have to go away from where I am, go out into the desert, become one of the Jewish people. And again, the question is, what does Yisrael hear that tells him, I can't just stay in my land and convert to this faith have to become a member of that nation and go out into that desert and join with them. Same thing, so the Rebbe explains what is it that Yisrael ascertained, Yisrael figures out 
that tells them the only way to properly be a Jew is to leave where he is and go where they are. And the answer is same thing. What do those two things mean? And the Rebbe presents us with an idea which is very, very constant in the Rebbe's teachings, which is that Torah is a combination of the highest chokhmah and the most basic action and everything in between. Torah is not a book of knowledge. It's a book of knowledge also. Torah is a book of practical instruction, of life. And Yisrael sees the expanse of Torah. He comes to appreciate what the Torah is trying to do. Torah is not a book of philosophy. It teaches us ideas. Torah is not a book of ritual. It teaches us how to act. It's both. Torah entails the highest and loftiest theological chokhmah and the most basic and ordinary practical religious action. And Yisrael says, for me to bridge these two, for me to make these two into one, I cannot do it where I am by simply learning the Torah. I need to leave where I am, go to the desert, join with the Jewish people, because only when I'm a member of this nation will I be able to religiously, truly join abstract thinking with practical action that they should both be consistent with the serving of a Kaddish Baruch This is Yisrael's big discovery. You follow? Yes? What teaches it to him? Kriyas Yantif. The splitting of the sea. And Mohammed Samalek, the world of the Malik. How? That's what the Rebbe says. Because what's the story of Kriyas Yantif? The sea split, right? No, it didn't. The sea didn't split. Nachshab and another jumped in. Right? The Egyptians are chasing the Jews. The Jews are in a total panic. Moshe is davening to and Hashem says to Moshe, stop praying, start commanding. What should I tell him? To walk into the water. So they walked into the water till here. And then the sea split. Yisrael learns the, the advantage of, of action and even action on the level of Kabbalah sale. You do what you're told, whether you understand it or not, whether you agree with it or not, that this is what you need to do, you go ahead and do it. This is the first thing Yisrael discovers, so when the sea split, it didn't split because Hashem made a nest, it split because the Jews did what they were told. Action. And Yisrael says, as great a person as I am, I need to learn that lesson and I have to be there to learn it. It's the one side of the coin. What's the other side of the coin? Muhammad Amalek. There's a war between the Jewish people and Amalek. And it's ironic how the Reb explains it. How did the war with Amalek happen? Because the Jewish people doubted. A Molech came and attacked the fringe. A Molech came and attacked the weakest Jews. Why? Because the Jews asked the question, Hayesh Hashem Bekirbeinu Im Oyin, is Hashem amongst us or not? It was a simple title of the words. Hayesh Hashem Bekirbeinu Mine, is God amongst us or not? Rashi brings, it's one of those Rashi's that you never forget once you learn it. Rashi says, a little boy is walking. And um, they pass by a toy. So the son says, well, can you give me the toy? He says, give me the toy. They go a little further. He says, can you give me the toy? Somebody comes to attack him. So the father picks him up. Someone tries to attack him in front. The father puts him behind him. The father tries to him in front of him. Then after all of these events, they walk a little further. They meet a man. And the little boy is sitting on his father's shoulders. And he says to the strangers, have you seen my father? <laughs> By the way, that that not it could happen. It happens in every home. You give your kid breakfast, you give your kid lunch, you give your kid supper, you buy him a toy, you take him on a trip, you protect him, and, da, 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 and then he has, where are my parents? How do my parents care about me? <laughs> so, so it actually describes the scenario. The father gives his kid this, this, he picks him up, puts him in front of him, puts him behind him, and then all of that, a stranger walks by, have you seen my father? So the father throws him to the ground. You know, get out of here. And the Malik attacks. Hayesh Hashem Bekebenu Amayim. Is God amongst us or not? And this is what allows the Malik to attack the Jewish people. But I want you to know what Hasidus says. Hayesh Hashem Bekebenu. Is Hashem amongst us on the level of Yesh? Im Ayin. Or is Hashem amongst us on the level of Ayin? Meaning the Jews were not questioning whether Hashem is around or not. The Jews were questioned whether Hashem is around us from a higher level called Ayin. Of from a lower level called Yesh. 
if Hashem is on a level of Yesh, then he's closer to us. If Hashem is on a level of Ayin, then he's farther from us. So their question was much adalet, much finer, much more theoretical, much more theological. But nevertheless, the Jewish people, after everything they've been through, all the miracles that happened, are still grappling with the imminence of Hashem in their life. Just how much control does Hashem have over our lives? How much can he protect us? How much can he bless us? The question, the doubt, the uncertainty brings on Malik. So Yisrael realizes that there's a part of Judaism that has to do with brain, with Ashkafa. So Yiddishkeit, on the one hand, is all about action. Shem says, walk into the water, you walk. And you keep walking and you keep walking and you keep walking. The water reaches your nostrils. You keep on walking and then the Yamsuf splits. And on the other hand, this trait is also about how we understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu, how we understand the relation between Hashem and the world in the most esoteric, in the most theoretical, in the most lofty of ways. So yesterday, here's about Kriyas Yamsuf, which was an event where the Jewish people acted. Here's about the attack from Amalek, which is an event which is a result of the Jewish people's lack of theological uh, trust. He says, if Yiddishkeit involves such extremes, I cannot become a gay tzedek and stay where I am. I cannot become a righteous convert and live in Yiddin. I have to join them. That's what the Sikha said, not what caused Yiddishkeit to convert to the Jewish people, but what converted forced Yiddishkeit to leave where he was a Gamal and to then live in Jordan. Okay? This was what we've been learning now for, I don't know when we stopped learning Siddur. I'm assuming we're talking about Pesach, right? When we, when, when we finished Mid Meshach and Yisabai David, this is what we started, okay? Now, I'm not, I have more to teach, and this only this is our last week, so I'm, I'm expecting next winter, next fall, to start with a little bit more on Yisai. Not a lot, but a little bit more. We'll be back. We're going to finish the story. We're going to get till, till the V of our Pasha, Yisai. And then we we'll go back to Hashem Elach, Hashem Elach, Hashem Elach. I'm, I'm dreading that because it's, all, it's five words with so much commentary, you have no idea. But we'll get to it, IYH, Amir to Hashem. Okay, today, I want to do two more things. The first, I actually want to read the Chumash. I'm going to read and translate the Chumash. I'm doing this because there's not that much Hasidus on this parasha, and the, the, but there is Hasidus. So by reading the Pesukah, we'll have an opportunity to taste a little bit of what's going on in the story. And the second is I want to read a medrash, which is you, which is on the third page of your stack. I copied it out of a Lakutis Sichus. And as always, we're going to read only the underline. I want to show you what the medrash says about Yisrael's emuna, about Yisrael's faith, okay? So if the clock will have mercy, and as we know, clocks have no hearts, but if the clock will have mercy, I uh, hope to get through both of these things to some extent. My only uh, pledge is that when I come back next year, I'm not continuing this. I'm going to move on to the next item, which will be, it'll be, it'll be Yisrael, but it'll be another part of the story. <coughs> now is the time for you to speak or comment. So the, the, the solution that you have medicine for this amount, it's a moment, but it's a power Right, right. And in the, but in the story, you had to fight with Havol. And uh, the, the, the Rashi says from the Chazal that to fight with Amalek, you had to be Anche Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu's people. Only Moshe Rabbeinu can fight with Amalek. Why? Because Yoidim Levatuk Shof, and this is what the Rashi says, they know how to destroy black magic. But Hasidus says, why do you have to be Anche Moshe? Why do you have to be one of Moshe Rabbeinu's people to fight with Amalek? Because if you approach the fight with Amalek with your Seichel, you're lost already. It has to come from Eisan, higher than Seichel. Moshe represents that. So that's why the warriors who fought with Amalek needed to have the property of Moshe Rabbeinu means a bit of Hashem, which is above their understanding, and a lot of the defeat Amalek, who just challenges any kind of understanding. Is that a fair answer? Yeah? Questions or comments? Okay, how do they say it in our culture? Go ahead. Just to clarify, let's see. Why did the people decide that he has to be with the Jews? There's two answers. One, he saw we need him. Why? How could it be that after all the miracles, Amalek was able to attack? And he answered, 
because after all the miracles, Klippa remains outside. So Yisrael says, I represent Klippa. By me joining, I'll remove the idea that Klippa is outside and they won't be able to attack my body. That's one answer. So Yisrael comes for us. The second answer is Yisrael realizes that to be a Jew is too involved. You got to be a part of the people. Because it involves the highest kinds of theology, seichel, and the most practical kind of action. To, for both of those things to be correct, you have to leave your home and go to the midbar. There's a two sikhs, two different sikhs. We learned them both. Clear? Okay. Any other questions or comments? If you have no questions, no comments, I am warning you. I'm actually going to go to this page. Okay, you're running that risk. <laughs> Okay, you're not afraid. Okay, so I'm not afraid either. We're going to read Chumash. I'm just reading scripture. I'm reading Chumash. Do you have a copy? There's a few more copies available. If you want a copy, there's a few sitting there. Oh. Huh. Would you have a stapler? Do you have one? Does everybody have one? I'm reading Chumash with Chumash, not Ashi. I'm just going to read and translate the Psukim. Okay? Yishma Yisra, Yisra hears, the priest of Midian, which meant he was a great intellectual and he was steeped in idol worship. He was the father of Moshe Rabbeinu, which means that he knew how to choose son in laws, right? Or in this case, his daughter chose a, son, a husband and he let her marry him. Everything that Elikim, that God, which he calls Elikim, did to Moshe and to his nation Israel. That he took the Jewish people out of Egypt. Now, girls, this apostle is saying what Yisrael heard that made him want to be a Jew. Rashi asks, Ma shmua shoma uba. In other words, yeah, Yisrael decided he wanted to convert. That's one thing. But Yisrael decided that he wants to leave his home and live with the Jewish people is another. So the Pasuk says what Yisrael heard that made him want to convert, which is Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, the accident. Rashi adds what makes Yisrael realize it's not enough for me to convert to become a Jew. I have to be join the family of Jewish people. And the answer for that is Kriyas Yamsuf Muhammad. So the story continues. Yisrael, the father in law of Meshad Abedu, takes as he pointed. Asia's Meisha, Tzipaydu was the wife of Meisha Rabbeinu. Acha she lucha after he had sent her off. The Eish Nebana and her two sons. Asher that Shema Echad Gersh. The first of the two sons' name is Gershoyim. What does Gershoyim mean? He all my Meisha Rabbeinu says Gera Yisi. I was an alien. I was a foreigner. Beres Nachri in a foreign land. And Gershoyim means that Hashem helped me as a Ger. Shema Echad Eliezer. The name of the other one is Eliezer. Right, you notice it doesn't say Shema Shemi. It says Shema Echa. They're both called one. Geshem is called one and Eliezer is called one. He has two children. They're both his only child. God, my father, help me. He saved him from the sword of Pad. He says, Rashi, that when Moshe Rabbeinu killed the Mitzri, and Dosan and Avidam informed against them, Pade actually captured him. And he put him on the executioner's block. And the executioner raised his axe and he lowered it with all of his might and made sure that his neck and the neck didn't split, didn't sever. And the neck became like stone shyish. And in the middle of the confusion, Meshach got up and he ran away. So the king had said that his sword should literally sever, chop off, and separate his head from his body. Okay, that's the Shakil. Okay, of the Ezra said so Yisrael takes Tipoida and her two sons, Gershman and Yazan, and brings them to in the desert. Because what's the background to the story? The background to the story is that once upon a time in Pasha Shmois, Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu to go and save the Jews, right? Which is a funny story in every aspect. Moshe is 80 years old. 80 years old, 80. He's been away from Egypt for most of his life, 50 years or 60 years, a very, very long time. During that time, he's on a bunch of stuff. He was a king in Ethiopia for a bunch of years. He spent a bunch of years in a dungeon in his house. And whatever, long story. 
Hashem tells Moshe, go back to Egypt and redeem the Jewish people. So Moshe's first reaction is me? I should redeem the Jewish people? I had a way. <laughs> I've been living in the fat of the land. <laughs> I saved myself from Goals Mitzayim. I avoided it. <laughs> my brother and my sister. Aaron and Miriam, they suffered with the Jewish people. They bled. The Jewish people, they cried with the Jewish people, they inspired the Jewish people, they should take that assignment. Hashem says, No, 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 you. So Moshe goes and finish the sentence. He takes his family with him, takes a long Tipeira, takes a long Eliezer, takes a long Gesh, as she says, of course, Chumash says that he hadn't yet done a bris on Eliezer, he was a newborn. And therefore, the whole thing happens. And the bottom line is this one of Moshe made a big concern is how his older brother is going to feel that the younger brother is the prophet of God and the redeemer. It doesn't make sense, right? In our passion, Pasha's Keda, you learn Chitas, you're paying attention to Rashi. Ah, Kairach believed in Moshe Rabbein. He respected Moshe Rabbein. But Kairach said not everything Moshe does is from Moshe. How do you know? Because some of the things he does make no sense. For example, Kahas has four sons, Amram, Yitzhak, Chevron, Uziel. So Aaron is the son of Amram and becomes the king of <clears throat> Moshe is the son of Amram and becomes the Melech. Who should be next? The son of Yitzhak. I'm Kairach ben Yitzhak. What does he do? He chooses only tough and then Uziel, the youngest of the four children's son, to become the leader of the Shevet Kahas. And Kairach says, this is corruption. This is politics. Adam got the first job, Moshe got the second job, I should get the third. I'm the third grandson. And he chose from the youngest son. Ah, no, 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 no. Moshe makes stuff up. So Kairach said Moshe Rabbeinu is Emes, but not every single word of Moshe Rabbeinu is Emes. No, I don't even know why I just told you that. Why did I just read? There's a reason why I'm telling this. I forgot. It'll come back in. Moshe is afraid that he's going to come to me. It's, oh, jealousy, no? Kairach was jealous. Kairach was jealous. And he makes a revolution. <laughs> it ends tragically. Moshe is afraid that Aaron is going to be jealous. And who would blame him? Aaron is five years older. Aaron is three years older. And he bled with the Jewish people for 83 years. Who was Moshe? He was a king in Ethiopia for 40 years. What in what entitles him? What schus does he have to be the redeemer of the Jewish people? So Moshe is hesitant. Hashem says, your brother's yeah. humble. Your brother is nice. He agrees he should be the leader. And you'll see, he'll come and greet you. He'll come and meet you, and you'll see how he's happy. Anyway, Adam comes to meet Moshe and Abedin, and Adam is delighted, and he gives Shalom Aleichem, and Moshe makes Shalom Aleichem, he gives him a kiss. He says, come. I'm Taka, older than you, but you're the prophet of God. You'll speak God's words. I'm going to repeat your words. Adam lets Moshe Rabbeinu know that he has zero jealousy, which, of course, is very important in that story. Adam is not jealous of Moshe Rabbeinu. He's happy to let his younger brother leave. But then he says, let me interrupt. Yeah. You want to hear a story? Anytime a teacher says you want to hear a story, is he going to hear it whether you want to or not? Yeah, but you want to hear a story? I heard the story from Rabbi Rubin from a lifting at Aiden. I used to dive in at the police station, Empire in New York. There's a show called Beis David Gershon. I dive in there for a very for many years. The rabbi was Rabbi Chaim Rubin, all of a shalom, of a holy, a beautiful Ben Aiden. Rabbi Rubin used to tell me stories, tell me many, many stories. And one of the stories that he told me was as follows: the first bells at Rebbe. Was the Shalom of Bells, the Sar Shalom of Bells, the big, big tzaddik. And he passed away. And when he passed away, he left many children. Who was his successor? Who took his place? His youngest son. What was his youngest son's name? Yeshua. You hear the story. The first bell that I passed away, his successor is not his oldest son, it's his youngest son. Yeshua Bells. Now, what was the tradition in that culture? In, in the Hasidic, in non Chabad Hasidic culture, the tradition was it's kind of hard to fathom, but that's how it was. By the Levaya, by the Levaya, by the funeral, 
They would announce who the next rabbi is, and everyone would say Mazel Tov at the funeral. So the Shalom Belzer passes away, the first Belzer Belzer passes away. His oldest son stands up. And he says, His name was Moshe. Moshe Kabrinian, 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 all those names. The oldest son of the Moshe. So he says, When you carry the Oren, the casket of Moshe Rabbein, now Moshe speaks. And what does Moshe say? Yeshua. <laughs> You understand? By the funeral, the first bells of his oldest son, whose name was Moshe, gets up and he says, When you carry the remains of, of, of the tzaddik, Moshe, Moshe, I am going to speak and I am saying that the Mamalamokim of my Rebbe is Yeshua. That's how he became the, the Rebbe. In any case, that's the story. The younger brother becomes the Rebbe, the older brother, the older brother is happy to see him and he's, he's going to serve at his at his, what, at his pleasure and so on and so forth. But he says, who are these? You know, the old story, you make a guy at Ebony, you tell him what to do, right? <laughs> There's a story, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you the whole story, but there was a chassid in Kushi Lepne, an old, old man, a chassid the Alter Rebbe yet. And when the Tzemachsadik passed away, and the third of them passed away, he went hunting for the next Rebbe. And there were seven candidates, seven sons, and he went from one to the next to the next. He comes over to the youngest, the Rebbe Marash. Rebbe Marash was 32. Kushalepa was upside 85, 85, 90. He was an old man. And he goes over to the Rebbe Marash, who was 50 years younger than him and more. And he says, after he, he spent some time, he went to this one, he went to this one, he checked him out. And he chose the youngest. He comes over to the Rebbe Marash. And he says, uh, until now, I spoke to you like friends, you. From now on, you're a Rebbe. Two on a hit on Zachsidus. Now put on your hat and say Chesidus. You make a guy a Rebbe and you tell them what to do. <laughs> Aaron comes out to greet Moshe Rabbeinu. He makes him a Rebbe. The first order of business is, who is this? Who's this? Who's this? It's my wife and children. And Aaron says, are you nuts? You know what's going on in Mitzrayim? You're bringing them? We're having so many talk. You're bringing your wife and kids to suffer? So Aaron makes Moshe a Rebbe and immediately gives them instructions. And Moshe listens. Moshe sends him home. Which is an interesting story. And you wonder what would have happened if Moshe didn't listen? What would happen if Adam doesn't speak up? Every one of these little details are probably very involved, but it's a story in the Chumash. So now it's two years later, a year and a half later. The 10 plagues have come and gone. The Jewish people have left with Zion and they're going to Harsinai. And Yisai says to his daughter and to his grandchildren, Come. Moshe sent you back to Egypt because he didn't want you to suffer. The suffering is over. Come rejoin your nation. So Yisrael leaves Medjani, goes out into the desert, the Midbar Sinai, and he approaches the Jewish camp to bring back to Meisha Rabbeinu, his wife, and his children. Okay? We read on. Yisrael, the father of Meisha Rabbeinu, comes. One of his sons, his wife, El Meisha, the Meisha Rabbeinu, El Amid, but out into the desert, that he's resting there, Har Alakim, opposite the mountain of God, which is called Har Sinai, of course. Yisrael leaves Midian. Midian, if you look at a, at a, at a, at a map, or what they call a, uh, I guess it's a historical atlas, a, a map of the ancient world. Midian is southeast of where Har Sinai is, something like that. Yisrael leaves his home and he comes to join Meisha Rabbeinu and he says, I came with your wife and your kids. So that, Yisrael sends a message. I am your father. You say, I have come to you. Your wife, and her two sons, be my wife. Says Rashi. You say, says, do me a favor. Come to the cab and send a message to Moshe Rabbeinu. And they say, excuse me? Go into the cab and send a message to Moshe Rabbeinu. So they say, do you know who Moshe Rabbeinu is? You know who he is? No, Moshe Rabbeinu is. He's the prophet of God. He's about to get us the Torah. He's a leader of millions of people. I should send you a message for you. He says, tell him his father-in-law. His shred. His father-in-law is here. Oh, really? You're Moshe's father? He says, yeah. And this is Moshe's wife. These are Moshe's kids. Send Moshe a message. So the messenger delivers the message. Why? Because it was an important message. 
the messenger shows up, he goes to the Mishnah of Eidu's tent, whatever, however he gets by the Rabbi Chadakov and Rabbi Groner and Rabbi Klein and Rabbi Krinsky and Rabbi Simpson and Rabbi Rochstein and Rabbi Quinn. He gets in to Moshe Rabbeinu and he says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I have a funny message for you. There's a guy outside and he says, he's your father-in-law. His name is Yisrael and he has your wife and your two kids. But what happens next? So, so, so Rashi says, by the way, that Yisrael says, I'm here. Come and see me. Oh, I'm not worthy. Your wife is here. Come and see her. Your wife is not worthy. Your kids are here. Come and see them. So Meisha Rabbeinu leaves the camp and he goes out of the camp to meet his father in law. So Rashi says, you can imagine what happens. Meisha Rabbeinu was the rabbi of several million Jews. He just took a man in Mitzrayim and he brought them into the midbar. They had the Mon and the Beirish of Miriam and Allah Brachas. So every good thing a person in what they had. And then Moshe Rabbeinu was taking a walk out of the camp, right? So right away, everyone is shushking, right? Where's Moshe? Where's he going? 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 He's running away. He said, they, they say his wife is there, his kid is here, they say his father is there. So when Moshe Rabbeinu goes out of the camp to meet Yisrael, everybody follows. So these four people, Yisrael and Tzipoida and Gersh and the other are standing outside the cloud. And all of a sudden, the clouds part. Here comes Moshe. Behind Moshe Rabbeinu is Aaron. And behind Aaron is another one of you, another one of this Canaan. All the most important Jews in the world came to give a covet to Yisrael and to Tzipeda and to Gershom and Eliezer. So, his father-in-law, he kisses him. One man asks his friend, how are you? So, Moshe bows to Yisrael. Moshe kisses Yisrael. And Moshe, who's called Ish, asks Yisrael Vosmachste, how are you? What's going on? How are things? Moshe wants of Yisrael, what's going on? Now, of course, you understand yourself. Yisrael's life has been a lot more stable than Moshe Rabbeinu's, right? Moshe Rabbeinu's life has changed a lot more than Yisrael's has. But nevertheless, Moshe says to his friend, Nu was Herzach, has life, how the sheep, how the goats, how the chickens, how the cows, how the wheat, how the corn, right? How's the fields, how's the business? He says, Baruch Hashem, he says, but. I, yes, he says, I came to get the tailor. I brought your wife, I brought your kids, I came to get the tailor. <laughs> They come into the tent. Now Moshe tells his father-in-law. In other words, first Moshe Rabbeinu says to Shved, how are you? And you have to assume Yisrael tells him. When he's finished, now Moshe Rabbeinu himself offers information. Maybe Yisrael says, and Vos too, how are you? So Yisrael Moshe tells him, he's called Asher Hashem, everything the Abish did, Lepari, all of a sudden, the parents of the Egyptian, on behalf, on account of the Jewish people, is kolat lo'o asher mo'oto osam baderech, as well as all of the the accidents, all of the confusions that happen on the road. They see them Hashem, and again and again and again, Hashem saves them. Hashem saves them from Mitzrayim. Hashem saves them from the Egyptians chasing them into the Yamsuf. Hashem chases them from the bitter water. Hashem protects them from hunger and famine, giving them one. And Hashem. Uh, saved them from Amalek, and Hashem brought them to Hasina to get the tail. We're good so far. We're good so far. So, Vayichad Yisrael, Yisrael is happy. I'll call out to you of all of them good. Asher Asa Hashem Yisrael, that Hashem did for the Jewish people. Asher Yisrael, that he saved them. Yad Hashem did have There's a very, very painful Rashi here. Vayichad means he was happy. But Vayichad also means to be poked by an evil. So Rashi says, Adasa again said that a righteous convert, he becomes a Jew. But it's not like he forgets his past. After all, Yisrael was a member of Messiah, of the court of Messiah. And when Yisrael hears how much Messiah suffered, it hurts him. He obviously is impressed by Hashem's power. He, he's, he's, um, he, he accepts that this is real. But on the other hand, Nasa Basari Chidudna Chidudna, his body becomes full of pimples, full of bumps to the thought that so many Egyptians were killed. It bothers him. 
That's why it doesn't tell you that you're never allowed to embarrass a gate, a convert, you're never allowed to embarrass because they're more sensitive. And that's the second type of a yicha. The first type is he was happy, he laughs. And the second type was that it hurts him. Okay? A yicha, yes, yes, he's happy or, or extolled. I'll call out you for all of the good that Hashem did for the Jewish people. I should see loy. He saved him. He had with him of Egypt, and then it says that Yehi Yisay says. What does he say? I'm asking you a question. How are you? What's Machstim? Who you answer? Baruch Hashem. Who's the first to say Baruch Hashem? Yisay by Yehi Yisay. Baruch Hashem. Finished. Now he says more stuff. But where does the expression Baruch Hashem come from first? Right here. Yes, they says, but blessed be God. Baruch Hashem. What's master? Baruch Hashem. Mi amalami. Who said Baruch Hashem? Yes, they says to me, Shalabeinu, thank God. Baruch Hashem. And this is the source of Baruch Hashem. this. I don't remember an earlier case in the tale where you have these words, Baruch Hashem. I don't think so. Yes, is the first person to say Baruch Hashem. But he adds more words. Baruch Hashem. Thank God. I said, He still asked for Mayad Misan that he saved you from the hand of the Egyptian. Or Mayad Padi from the hand of the Pharaoh. I said, He still as an army saved the people. Mitachas Yad Misan for being under the hands of the Egyptians. And he adds, Ata Yadaiti. Now I know. Ki godol Hashem ikolo alakim that Hashem is greater than any other gods. Ki badovar Hashem zodu because of the very very thing that they did to hurt the Jewish people, alehem the Eibush gave them back. So Rashi says that Hashem didn't just punish Mitzrayim; He punished Mitzrayim midah keneged midah measure for measure. And this gets Yisrael. Hashem is a king. You mess with a king, what does he do? He chops your head off. <laughs> The Abish doesn't go around chopping off heads. He gives back measure for measure. And the thing that they sinned, Allah, that's what he punishes them. And that's what he says. Let's read you and Yudalf again. He says, Baruch Hashem, thank God. Asher Hitzel Aschem, he saved you. Miyad Messiah, Miyad Parim, hand of Egypt, and hand of the Pharaoh. Asher Hitzel Aschem, he saved the people. Mitachas Yad Messiah, under the time. Ata Yedaiti. Now I know. Chigadol Avayim, we call the Kim. The Abish is better than all of the gods. What's my proof that Hashem is greater than any of the gods? Because he didn't simply punish Mitzrayim, he punished them, me, duck and egg, me, the measure for measure. Exactly the thing that they sinned, Alayim, that's what he gave back to them. Okay? Good? Yes? We're breaking, and we're going to come back soon. Okay? Please. Why nobody is afraid of this message? Yisrael. People have that. It's not common, but people have that in Yisrael. Because he's like, you know, if you're saying, like, those converts need to want to come to mind, like, they're also really good, like, Sarah Ruth, they come to mind. You know, what boy is it? No one's really thinking of Sarah Ruth. Ruth is the mother of all converts, male and female, really. That's the truth. But Ruth comes after. Ruth is after Mount Taylor, right? There are people with the name Yisrael. It's not a very common name with the name Yisrael. I think. Well, it's, an, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. Please. Oh, yeah. I'm, I was started off so good, and now I started running out of steam. <laughs> I'm going to turn this off. You'll turn it back on.